Hi, everybody. Good um, morning. Hope you uh, slept better than I did. I didn't sleep a lot. Long evening yesterday. Um, hi. Before uh, we get started, normally when I uh, give a talk, I'd like to do a quick introduction of who I am. I have two versions of that introduction. One is five minutes and one is 15. Uh, who here wants me to do the long introduction just so they know who I am? I see one. I'll give it to you in person later. <laughs> so, um, hi, my name is Rami Ismail. I'm one half of Dutch Independent uh, Studio of Lambier. Um, I do business and I do programming. Uh, I started as a programmer originally, but um, if my co-founder did the business, we'd have, we'd have been out of business a decade ago. Uh, this is my co-founder. He's our uh, designer, and uh, JW uh, and me uh, have made quite a few games since we started. We're best known for Super Crate Box, but also for Gun Gods, Ridiculous Fishing, Luft Trousers, and most recently, Nuclear Throne. We, uh, start, we met, me and JW met, at a university. We both went to the same university to study game design and development. Um, it didn't go well. Turns out we're not good at school. Um, so we dropped out, which is a bad idea. Don't do it. If you're a student and you're here, don't do what I did. Bad idea. Um, in fact, it was such a bad idea that even though JW had this prototype of this amazing game that he called Crates from Hell, when we uh, dropped out of school, we still had to eat these for the first year of um, Flambeer. They're actually quite good. I wouldn't recommend them, but, you know, if you only have 99 cents to eat, they're, they're good. Uh, so, yeah, we were instantly rich. This was... Uh, this was my drink supply for a week, I think. Probably more than a week. Um, so we didn't have money, and we dropped out of school, so we were in trouble. So we were only good at one thing, and that one thing was making video games, so we decided that if we were gonna make money, we might as well do it making video games. So we made a video game about fishing with machine guns. Ash, you do. Um, and then we took the money that we made with that game and turned that little prototype that I showed you before into Super Crate Box. Super Crate Box was our first hit. It was a freeware game, so we didn't get any money, but it was our business card. This was, in 2010, how people were going to know about us. This really small, tight, well-designed little platformer. So it was a huge hit. Um, tons of people played it. Uh, we got nominated for the Independent Games Festival Award, which is like the Oscars for indie games, which is nice. Uh, so we stayed very humble, and uh, we made more games. Uh, this was Gun Gods. This was a first-person shooter about hip-hop on Venus. And then people started asking, like, wow, you make cool games. You should give talks. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess. Uh, we don't know what we're doing, but if you want us to talk, like, sure, we'll, we'll get on the stage and talk. I'm still doing it. It's strange, isn't it? Um, and then we made more games. This is Serious Sam, The Random Encounter. We, we, somebody asked if you wanted to make a Serious Sam game and gave us the rights for it, so we did. Uh, then we went to more conferences. We started selling our own T-shirts. Selling your own T-shirts, if you're an independent developer, make your own T-shirts. It feels awesome, greatest thing ever. Um, and then we started working on a new game called Ridiculous Fishing. You know that fishing game about fishing with machine guns that I talked about at the start? Well, we decided that that would be a really good iOS game. So we started working on this as an iOS game, and it was awesome. We got a great team together, good people, Zach Gage from New York, uh, Greg Mullwind, uh, Eirik Surke, um, just an all-star team, great people. So. Everything was going awesome, which means that obviously that was going to end, and it did. Um, it ended because another company from San Francisco decided that our idea was, idea was really good and decided to just clone and copy it and release it before we could. That was shit. It was actually really bad. Uh, what happened is, if you're a game developer, you believe in creativity, and you believe that creativity, if you, if you make cool stuff, that it will hopefully pay off in the end. And to kind of get punched in the face with, well, if you're very creative and you make cool stuff, somebody else will just copy you, it didn't help. So we got really um, sad and angry. So we went to the New York Times, and uh, we, we did an article with them about cloning, and that got us a lot of support from a lot of people. We ended up speaking at a lot of conferences about game cloning, and um, that was actually really great. We got more involved in the, in the indie scene and started organizing our own events. We started working on new games, uh, we were very angry, so we made a very angry airplane game. It was nice. Uh, we got even more involved and started like doing more event stuff, 
and helping other developers. And then finally, after years of work, we finished Ridiculous Fishing. And that was one of the hardest things we've ever done, was finishing this game that had hurt us in a weird way. Um, but then at the end of all that hurt was something really cool, because Apple decided that it was the game of the year in 2013. It was the best iOS game that had released that year, according to the people that made the device you played it on, which, that's cool, it's really cool. Um, so suddenly we were back and we were happy and uh, we decided that really what we wanted to do was make more games about explosions. So we started working on Nuclear Throne, which is a top-down roguelike that's released on uh, Steam and PS4 and PS Vita and a bunch of other stuff, uh, Mac, Linux. Um, and that's where we are now. Uh, I also travel around the world, I give talks, I help developers in emerging territories uh, figure out how to build communities and how to make game development an easier thing where they live. Uh, so that's what I do. Any questions about who I am or what I do? No? Good, cool. So um, my talk is called uh, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly. Echarlo se llama El Bueno, El Malo y El Feo. Y la cuestión es que a mí se me da fatal enviar títulos a eventos, o sea que al final el evento me ha puesto el título y me encanta, o sea, estoy encantado y les doy las gracias. Siento ponerme serio a estas horas de la madrugada, pero bueno, es el bueno, el malo y el feo. Y me gustaría hablar de una cosa feo que he visto en las noticias hace un par de días cuando venía para acá. Esto os va a doler tres minutos y luego volvemos a la charla, ¿vale? Porque antes me gustaría hablar de esto. El día que venía para acá me enteré de esto y es feo y pasó en la escena de desarrollo española y me gustaría hablar de esto un momento. Luego pasamos a la charla, de verdad. Eh, unas desarrolladoras intentaron organizar un evento para mujeres junto con King Barcelona y hubo tal acoso que al final acabaron por cancelarlo. Estoy seguro de que no tengo que recordaros como desarrolladores que en la industria hay grupos de interés especial y que podemos aprender teniendo conversaciones abiertas sobre temas que compartimos todos. A ver, ¿qué, ¿para qué existe esto? Esto existe para desarrolladores españoles y esto también existe para desarrolladores holandeses y para programadores de C++ o para gente que hace música orquestal. Hay grupos especiales para esta gente para que puedan hablar ellos solitos sin que nadie meta las narices, sin que nadie les diga es que los de C++ son penosos. Porque tú no quieres que haya esa gente en un grupo que habla de C++. Pues igual pasa con eventos como esto, que puede ocurrir perfectamente bien para mujeres. Y la cuestión es que estas personas se pueden sentir seguras, sobre todo personas que a lo mejor normalmente no se sienten seguras. Y es importante que puedan hablar con libertad sobre temas que a lo mejor les afectan solo a ellos y con pasión sobre cosas que les, les apetecen. Es fantástico. O sea que me gustaría hablar con la industria española. Vosotros sois la industria española, sois los de aquí. Y me da igual que estéis a favor o en contra del entorno político. Me da igual. Lo que es importante es que demostréis vuestro apoyo por eventos así, por eventos que están dentro de esta comunidad. Son gente que les gustan los juegos, que les apasionan que a lo mejor no están ya en el mainstream, pero están ahí, están en la industria, y es vuestra industria, y vuestra industria los tiene que acoger con los brazos abiertos y que se sientan seguros. Estos acosadores os están haciendo daño a vosotros, no solo a las mujeres, no, a los desarrolladores, a todos, a la comunidad de juegos española. A todo el mundo, esto es nocivo, es malo. ¿Por qué esto va por todo el mundo? Esta noticia ha salido por todo el mundo y la gente la ve y se pregunta cómo será de profesional esta industria que ni siquiera permite que haya un grupo que se reúna tranquilamente, sin preocupaciones de seguridad. Y no es un fallo de los organizadores, es un fallo de los acosadores. 
ya que si podéis, por favor, dar apoyo a eventos así, a gente que organiza esto, que les dedica su tiempo, su energía, a organizar algo así, que haya tiempo para que estas personas se puedan reunir y hablar de las cosas que nos interesan. No luchéis contra los organizadores, da igual si vosotros pensáis que esto hace falta o no. Ellos piensan que sí, igual que los de C++, que a lo mejor piensan que es el mejor lenguaje para desarrollar. Pues que lo piensen y que tengan un espacio para hablar. Ellos probablemente se han planteado las implicaciones morales, pero da igual, o sea, no, no podéis apoyar el acoso, ni indirectamente. La comunidad de desarrollo abre está abierta a todo el mundo, todos, todos y cada uno de vosotros habéis luchado hora tras hora para estar aquí, para hacer juegos de vídeo, estar orgullosos de lo que hacéis. Todo el mundo tiene que poder sentirse así, todo el mundo tiene que poder sentirse que nuestra industria va a estar ahí para defendernos a todos, a todos y cada uno, que vamos a luchar para que se respete a la gente que tienen menos poder, menos visibilidad, que nosotros vamos a estar ahí para apoyarles a su trabajo, a sus juegos, aunque no los entendamos, aunque no nos gusten, aunque nos importen un pimiento. Deberíamos demostrar que tenemos curiosidad por los juegos que no existen todavía, pero que podían existir, las bases que podrían estar y no están todavía, porque somos desarrolladores de juegos, somos el futuro de los juegos, no presente. Creamos juegos, nos encanta, por eso estamos... So um, I went to my dentist the other day, and uh, I walked into the room, and my dentist was looking at a photo of my teeth. You know, one of the x-rays? He was looking at it, and a few years ago I had a root canal, you know, where they, dr they drill out the, the nerve of your, it's gross. Uh, and then they fill it up with some sort of metal, and he was looking at the photo, and I walked in and I said, I don't like how it looks. I was like, what, what do you mean? Do you have to do it again? Is it wrong? Is my tooth broken? Like, what, what happens now? He's like, no, I just don't like how it looks. Like, what do you, like, you don't, you're a dentist. What does that mean? He's like, well, I just, I, I don't like how it looks. I've done better ones. Wh you, huh? He said, well, I just, it, it, it looks bad. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, this diagonal. I'm like, what, are you talking about, like, the aesthetics? He said, yeah, it doesn't look nice. And that's when I learned that my dentist is an artist. <laughs> and I never thought about it, but it kind of makes sense. This guy spends the majority of his life looking down people's teeth with like the gross rests of their breakfast and then fixes it. And that's his job. There's no way you would do, do that job unless you really care about teeth, right? Like there's something in their life that made them go like, I love teeth. I'm going to work on them for the rest of my life. It turns out that my dentist, like we do, has a favorite set of teeth. It's, I asked him, it's an old lady's teeth that he worked on from like 40 years ago when he just started. And he's very proud of those teeth. Every time she comes by, he's happy about it. So we talked about art. And he said, well, art is, you know, it's, it's creativity, but in, in a way, it's just personal, right? Art is not something that we all agree on. And what you might think is art, you might disagree with. So art is personal. Art, and in many ways, art is a personal expression. Art is, creativity is, better said, is a combination of all the things we know and all the things we care about, and the more we know, the more creative things we can make. But that also means that if creativity is personal, it means that it's unique. Your art, in many ways, is like a fingerprint. This is mine, you don't have it. And whatever is in your fingers, that's yours, and I don't have it. I can't make your game, so whatever game you make is unique. Nobody can make it. Even if you try to clone something, the things you decide to clone are unique to you. When I try to clone Flappy Bird, 
The thing I was really interested in was whether the bird actually speeds up when it falls, and it turns out it doesn't. And then I was done cloning because I figured out what I wanted to know. But it was fascinating to do. Other people clone Flappy Bird to earn money. And other people cl uh, clone Flappy Bird to add a skin of Mario and then sell that and then get a DMCA from Nintendo because they don't like that. Everybody clones their own way. Everybody creates their own way. Now, a fingerprint can really be anything. Uh, I'm a programmer. I'm sort of a business-minded person. I'm a practical person. So when I look at things, I like to see systems. Like I, when you all sat down here in this room, I wondered why you all sat where you sat. Why are there so many people up front that are like sort of scattered out in groups? Like a lot of people leave two seats next to them. Like is that human? Is that psychology? Why does that happen? Why do we sit apart? There's two seats, there's two seats, there's two seats. Is Everywhere, it's just a human pattern. And I look at the room and that's what I think. And that's how my brain works, because I'm me. And if I hope for you all that your brain doesn't work that way, because my God, it's tiring to do that every time you see a room. But everybody has their own fascinations and obsessions. And I always feel that great creative work shows that fingerprint. Uh, if I show you a bunch of games, you should be able to figure out who the creators are. Uh, this one is easy. I interviewed this guy yesterday. This is Fumito Ueda. And uh, he makes games about, as he said himself, touch, about interaction, about uh, communication, about failure to communicate. Um, he, m he avoids language. He uses sort of a muted palette, uh, always sort of like muted colors. Uh, very visual, very visually pleasing because of his history as an animator. Um, but then you have somebody like Ren uh, Brandon Chung, who created uh, Quadrilateral Cowboy, and you see like this sort of these cubes, you see these bright colors. Uh, the gameplay is always very innovative. Uh, he tends to use movie-like structure. It was the first game where I ever saw a smash cut in gameplay. If that doesn't make sense to your brain, you should play 30 Flights of Loving because that's a good game. Like You should, you should play that game. Um, or this one. Like Who can guess what studio made this? This is the Supergiant studio, the same people who made Bastion. Um, and, I mean, even if you don't know this game, but you know Bastion, um, you should be able to pick that out, or Transistor, because it's the same style. It's the colors, it's whimsical, it has atmosphere. Um, it has somewhat traditional gameplay with a nice twist on it. Um, so I, I talk about this a lot, and I often get the question, well, how do I find my fingerprint? And I've got good and bad news for you. The good news is somebody will tell you. Like, you're not going to find it yourself. Somebody's going to come up to you and tell you. The bad news is, to get to that point, you have to create a lot, and somebody has to actually give a shit, which does it pretty hard. Um, the idea that you create your own fingerprint is as nonsensical as that you create this fingerprint. You don't. It grows on you, and then you can scan it, you can check it, you can look at it. But you can't create it. It's similar when people say, like, oh, you just have to make inspiration. I'm like, what does that mean? You just got to make inspiration. Like I've sat in a room desperate for inspiration for days and it doesn't happen. And sometimes I don't need inspiration because I'm on a holiday and it doesn't stop happening. Like you don't make those things, they kind of happen. So the best way I've found to find your own fingerprint is to create. It's to create a lot. It's not to create like a few things. It's to create things that you believe in. Not necessarily things that make money. This is a good thing to do when you don't have to make money or it's like a side thing. Um, and when you do, don't make compromises that you and your team don't believe in. Um, I do think, however, that it's important to find this fingerprint. And like I said, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be an art style. It doesn't have to be colors. It, it can be music. Like, I mean, when you think about it, Bastion and Transistor are both known for a narrator. Not for like their mechanics or anything, um, even though they are good. Uh, but it can also f be the way you find inspiration. At Vlambeer, we get our inspiration from documentaries and bad sci-fi books. Just as how our process works, we'll be watching a documentary about fishing, and then we'll be talking about Duck Hunt, and then we make a game about fishing with machine guns. Um, it can be about crosses. Me and my co-founder hate each other. This is like a well-known fact. Um, we just don't like each other. So we never liked each other. We like working with each other, but my God, I would never invite him to my birthday. And he would never invite me to his. And that's fine, because we don't have to like each other. We respect each other's work. So I do also want to say that a lot of people start searching for this because they want to find their fingerprint. And I do want to reassure you, it's not important to find it. 
What's important is to search for it. It's a small distinction, but it matters. If you're actively searching for your fingerprint, you're getting deeper into the things you like, the things you enjoy, the things you appreciate. So if you just search, you're growing. If you find it, you've hit a wall, and that's probably actually bad, uh, not good. So, in a way, games are a work of art and of passion and of care and of love, and that's beautiful. Congratulations, you have an awesome hobby. But they have to go mess it up and make it a job. So sacrifice everything I just said to money and business and funding and process and marketing and all that stuff, right? Not, not really. Um, really what I'm trying to say is when we think of games, the romantic notion of making games is that we have an idea and we put it on a computer and then other people can play it. And the reality is you have an idea and the idea is broken and bad and would never work on a computer. It only works in your head. So when you try to program it, it's, can I swear? All right, it's fucked. It will never work. The idea in your head will never work. That's not, if, if it would work, we didn't need programmers, right? Um, but they don't. Computers are not very smart. Ones and zeros, that's all they do. Well, our brain, if I tell you, well, there's a game and there's a dragon in a sky castle and you go there with your, uh, with your burning sword to beat it, you have a mental image. You can imagine that entire scene. Well, try doing that with a computer. There's a dragon. The computer's like, what's dragon? And it's like, it's a creature. What's a creature? Well, cre it's like a monster, but like more generic. Okay? Let's define, define that class, please. And you do that, and it's like, well, how big is the dragon? It's like, well, this big. And now you're on the wrong scale. And you know the whole thing. You've done it a million times before. The idea in your head will never be a video game. And part of that is because games are a complex, uh, complex product. Actually, they're kind of the worst product. There's few products that are as horrible to make as a video game. Like, you start on it, you're going to spend, what, a year, three years on it? And at the start of that, you need to know whether people will buy it at the end. Well, good luck with that. Uh, that's not how it works. Like, you can guess, maybe. And then, uh, now you have a game, and I just said one to three years. I'm a programmer. You know the rule number one with programmers and timings and schedules? Don't believe me. If I say one to three years, it could be two weeks. It could also be six years. It could be anything. Honestly, that's for most creatives. Artists, don't believe them. Musicians? Designers? <laughs> nah. Um, there's this huge number of moving parts, and every single one of them can break. And you know what the fun part is? If one of those pieces breaks, everything breaks. Your designer is late? Good luck programming that. Your programmer doesn't do the work on time? Good luck designing that. Your artist doesn't have the assets? Have fun gray boxing until two weeks before launch. Your writer forgot to write the script? Oops. Your writer wrote the script, but your designer changed everything? Have fun. This is our job. It's a giant clusterfuck of just things we do to ourselves. And it's not because we're bad at our job. It's just that games are complex. They're unpredictable. Like, code is unpredictable. Code is a horrible... We're tricking... Somebody said this on Twitter the other day. We're tricking a piece of stone to believe that it can think based on our calculations. That's what a processor is. It's just a piece of stone. It's a piece of silicon. We're telling it, well, here's a bunch of zeros and ones. Put a dragon on my screen. That's our job. It's ridiculous. If, this, if somebody told somebody that this was a job back in the Middle Ages, they would have said it was sorcery, that we could make stones make dragons. That's our day-to-day -day job. It's kind of awesome when you think about it. And then, even if you get everything right, by the time you're done, you know what's hit now? It's not Minecraft anymore. No, it's uh, Player Unknown's Battleground. <laughs> Too bad about all the blocks you made, but it was zombies all along. You know what? If you start on a zombie game today, if you're going to take two years, you're going to be too late. Shit, if you're making a zombie game today, you're too late. Because if Player Unknown has it's like zombies, like did it, then we're done. So, uh, yeah. Games are actually really bad products. It's just not a good idea. They're, they're like this huge logistics problem. We're like trying to balance resources and money and time and people and features and problems in our market. And then we're working with some of the most complex, most rapidly shifting, most unpredictable things in the world. Humans. Technology, creative, humans, industry, commercial. It's like if you try to explain to somebody why we do this job, you must sound out of your mind. And you are. 
but you're passionate, so that's fine in many ways. Now, there is absolutely a strength and limitation. And I'm sure you've heard that before, that all of these things are fine because they can help the creative pro process. And I agree with that. But I don't agree that that's just something you can say. Limitation is good. No, limitation is good if you choose to use it. And that means that if you are an independent developer, what you want to create is a feedback loop between your creative and between your business that allows both of them to work optim optimally, that you create boundaries between creative and business. That's Lambier, I do business. My co-founder does creative. If we're arguing about design, he has final say. I will not argue if he says this is better. If it's a business decision, I got final say, and I don't care what he says. Well, I do care, but I'm probably not going to listen because I don't like the guy. Um, but if you're going to deal with limitations, if you're going to deal with all of these problems in games, there's a few things that are really important. And one of the most important one is internal communication. How many of you work in a team? Just by raise of hands. How many of you, and this is awkward if your boss is sitting next to you, how many of you think communications in your team is done the best way possible? Is he zero? Going once? Going twice? One. Are you the boss in the company? <laughs> oh, okay. One. Turns out that communication is really hard. Um, but what's important is that if something goes wrong, that you're communicating. Not when it goes wrong, no, when it becomes a possibility that it can go wrong. If you are having problems with your resources, if your launch date shifts forward or backward, let your team know. If you're the producer, why, why would you not? Just tell them, hey, listen, there might be a possibility that we're going to have to cut these features, so make sure that you kind of handle this, and then you just leave them to mess around. Right? But at least now they know. That's important. If you're a designer, if you're a programmer, and you find out that what you're trying to implement is actually going to take two weeks instead of three days, let your producer know. If you're a freelancer, let the person you're working with know that things are not going to work out. And if you create that, if you create that method of communication, that honest, open communication about a process, it can actually be very powerful. There's a reason game jams work so well. They're bad ideas. Like I said, games, games are complex, and now we're going to make them in two days. But you know what's great about that? Everybody knows it's two days. Everybody knows that at the end of this, this is not a commercial project. You know what comes out of it? Beautiful things. Game jams create some of the most interesting games, not even commercial games, but just two days of creativity can create amazing things that you almost wonder why we do anything else but game jams to start our projects. And the only reason is because it's limitation wielded properly. If you can wield limitation, if you can use it in your process, it can be very powerful. What's also important about communication is that if you go to your designer and you go, thank you so much for the past four weeks of work, also, I fucked up a deal, so we only have three weeks left. Can you cut everything again? That will destroy the motivation in the team. It will destroy people's fun in their job. And like I said, a lot of why we work, a lot of why we're here is passion. So make sure you keep people motivated and make sure you communicate. That friction, the friction between business and creative, is exactly where you live as an indie. If you're an independent developer, you have chosen for that line. And I often hear people say, well, you know, indies are just not as businessy as AAA. Do people hear what they say when they say that? I've never spoken to a AAA developer who's like, well, I was doing my, accountant, uh, my accountancy the other day, and I had to keep all the receipts from the trip I went to because, my God, like, otherwise my account gets really upset. And I was negotiating a deal with Microsoft for a next. No AAA artist will ever say that. No, we chose business. Not the trip ways. The trip ways just chose a job. They chose, they chose a job where they go to work, they get to be creative, they get to do the job they want, and then they go home. We chose the company. We chose that. Trip way is in business. We are business. That's kind of cool. Like people think of that as like a bad thing. Well, but I came here because creativity. You did. And you can put business in, in support of creativity. Some people are here because of business. And they put creativity in support of business. Neither is wrong. Neither is right. But the honest truth is, indies do way more business than any AAA ever will. So 
The strange thing about game development, because it is so complex, is that a lot of the most common questions that developers have actually have no good answer. Um, a question I get a lot is, when should I announce my game? No good answer. Uh, should I start with a mobile game or a PC game or a console I don't know. Do I focus, this is a really cool one, when you make a big game, do you, fo fo do, well, do you focus on the start of the game that everybody's going to see? Or do you focus on the end of the game that only the people that care are going to see? Which one is more important? Which one do you spend more resources on? Uh, should I hire an extra artist, keep my team small? Do I push through a bit of work by working overtime or do I make sure my team is happy? Another one, do I launch my game before October, even if that means I have to cut some corners, or do I wait until January? I don't know. There's no right answer, like every answer is different. So if there's no good answer and it's complex and this is a bad industry and a bad product, how do you make games? Well, there's two lessons I've, I've learned from other developers that I'd like to give you as well because they've helped me a lot. So the first one is to build bridges and to leave bridges. So when you create work, when you help others, when you're supportive of others in this industry, you will build bridges. And building bridges is good. You can share your knowledge, you can share your tools, you can share your contacts, you can share your resources. Uh, I used to work on something called Indie Mega Booth, which is an example of that. A lot of indies together are a lot more powerful than an indie apart. A lot of indies in one place have a lot more impact than a lot of indies not in one place. It's that simple. You work, you work with each other, you help each other. But Sometimes it's also important to realize that some bridges that you've built are not necessarily worth keeping up. That some people are jerks. That some business partners are not good to work with. That if somebody doesn't pay you, that they're not worth working with. And the other way around, that people will leave bridges that you break. If you don't pay somebody, they will leave. If you don't pay somebody you're working with, but you do expect a lot of work from them, they won't do it. So don't forget that Business is business, doesn't mean being ass. It means that friends could be friends, but if the business deal is bad, it might be better to go with not friends. And sometimes, even if the business deal is worse, it might be better to go with the friends anyway. But the most powerful thing I've ever learned was uh, Don Baglow once told me that the most important thing he had ever learned, and he's been in this industry for decades and decades, longer than most people I know, probably the person who's been in the games industry the longest that I know, he said, decide and don't accept. And what it made me realize is that a lot of choices we make are not actually choices. We just look at things and we go, yeah, that's how it is. The game is full screen because it's full screen. A platformer goes from left to right because it goes from left to right. An RPG has health and mana because that's how RPGs work. But we're just accepting. There are choices that you can make in there that nobody has made. You know what Gone Home is? Even if you don't like Gone Home, you know what it is? It is what if Bioshock without guns. That's, it, that's what it is. That's what they said it is. That's what the developer said it is. It is Bioshock without the guns. Why did nobody make Bioshock without guns? Because we look at something like a first person shooter and what needs to be in a first person shooter? A gun. And somebody took one moment to go, do we need the gun? They said no, and they made a hit game. There's a lot of things that we just do because that's how they are. We need certain sizes of teams, we need certain types of people, we need expertise, and I mean, do we need those? Have we asked ourselves? Have you asked yourself? In your game, in your current project, how many of the things you're doing are just acceptance rather than choices? A lot of things you see as normal are just choices you've never thought about. You just accept them for the default answer and that's it. And you've never actually spent just a minute thinking about how they could be different. And a lot of people do that because they're afraid of choices and that's the final lesson I want to leave you with. Is a lot of people regret a lot of their choices as a developer. They look at things and they said, oh, if only I had done this or only if I had known that. And the truth is, that's useless. I don't, want you to, I don't want to tell you that you shouldn't feel that way. I don't want to ever tell you that you have to feel a certain way or that you should not feel a certain way. No, what I want you to know is that there is not a single human, not one on this entire planet, that looks at two choices and goes, I'll pick the worst one. Including you. You have never made a bad choice in your life in that way. Because when you made that choice, you did it to your best intent with the best knowledge you ever had. 
And if you had better knowledge, if you had a different view, if you had more information, you might have done it differently, but it doesn't matter because you didn't. You tried. And in game development, especially a place where so many questions are so uncertain and so impossible to answer, please don't worry about regretting your choices. Because you try. And like everybody else, you didn't look at two choices and you went, well, that's the worst one. Let's do that. That's it. Do I have time for Q&A? Five minutes. Five minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Can be about anything, by the way. It doesn't have to be about what I just talked about. I'm here. Nobody? I'll tell you a story about questions. Oh, no, there's a question. Is this on? Yep. It is. It seems like you have a little problem with the titles of your conferences. Who's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly here? I think, I think the way I structured the talk is the good is that we work in a medium that we're passionate about. The ugly is that we don't get to choose how we use it because games are complex. So in many ways, we don't get to just be creative. Either we work for somebody and we have to listen to them, or if we want to be fully creative, we have to do the business of being independent. And the ugly, well, I started my talk with the most ugly thing I saw. But I think the ugly is coming to terms with that, and a lot of people have trouble doing that and then realizing that a lot of what we do is not necessarily the prettiest thing we can do or the best thing we can do, it's just what has to do. Like when I think about my games, I don't think of them as beautiful creations. Like they're, as far as I know, they're broken pieces of shit that are hanging together with duct tape because one day I was sad and decided that this was bad and now I'm gonna take out this character and add a gun. And that's the, like, that's uh, Lufthrausers, if I play that game, I still feel angry because I made that game because we were angry. That's why we made it. We just wanted to make a game about big explosions and shooting stuff because somebody stole our game. So I don't, I don't see games as beautiful. I see them as kind of ugly, and I think that ugliness is kind of the beauty of it. Like you play that game and you go like, oh yeah, I feel something here. That's cool. Uh, so it was kind of that structure. I mean, it was, it was fun to work with the title. I was like, oh, this is cool. I think I can do something with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really bad at coming up because the v often event organizers ask you like three weeks in advance, four weeks in advance, and I haven't talked to all of you, so I don't know what you want me to talk about. So I'd rather just let them make a title, and then yesterday I go talk to everybody and go like, well, what do you want me to talk about? And then I talk about that. It's more fun that way. Anything else? No? All right, if anybody has, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I just got the like, if you do one more question, I'm going to kick you off the stage signal. But... Um, come find me after this talk and we'll, we'll have a chat. If anybody else have any, has any other questions, I'm at T-H-A underscore Rami on Twitter. Oh, I forgot to put it on the slide. Uh, find me there, DM me, message me, whatever, if you have questions. I'm going to be around. I'm the, call, I'm the tall dude with the leather jacket and the backpack. Thank you so much for your time.